evening, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of an Affinity and IEP partnering webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and to all descendants who have cared for this place since creation. We also honour all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us tonight. My name is Monica Attard, I'm the Head of UTS Journalism and Co-Director of the Centre for Media Transition. As well, I'm on the Affinity Advisory Board. For those of you joining us for the first time, let me briefly introduce you to the Affinity Intercultural Foundation. Affinity was formed by a group of young Muslim Australians in the year 2000. Affinity's aim is to promote multiculturalism and foster intercultural and interfaith dialogue by building bridges between different groups in society. Tonight's webinar episode is in collaboration with the Institute of Economics and Peace. Together, they have hosted two webinar episodes, including the 2020 Global Peace Index launch and the COVID-19 and Peace Briefing webinar. If you'd like to watch the previous webinar episodes, they're always accessible and available on Affinity's YouTube page. Facilitating tonight's webinar is Dr. Julian Drugan. Julian heads the Terrorism Research Program at the Department of Security Studies and Criminology at Macquarie University. His current research includes work on violent extremist propaganda, terrorism and social media and far-right extremism. He's the editor-in-chief of the Routledge Journal of Policing, Intelligence and Counterterrorism and a regular visiting lecturer at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Welcome, Julian. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you to you, Julian. I'm really looking forward to the insights. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Attard. Thank you very much for your warm introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight facilitating what is the third uh, webinar in our series between the Institute for Economics and Peace uh, and Affinity. Uh, and tonight I'm coming to you from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Now tonight my guest is Charles Allen, the Director of Partnerships at the Institute for Economics and Peace, or IEP, uh, as they're often known by their friends. Now this month the IEP has released the Ecological Threat Register. Uh, it's a report which highlights the global hotspots that are exposed to higher risk of ecological events uh, and measures the types of ecological threats to countries uh, that are predicted to face uh, these sorts of challenges in the future between now and 2050. So it's going to be a very big issue that we're going to talk about tonight, a very topical issue now and for the decades to come. And before we begin our conversation, I'd like to remind you to please write down your questions in the chat area. Uh, we'll try to answer all of them in the allocated Q&A session uh, at the end uh, of, this, uh, of this discussion. So I'd like to welcome tonight's distinguished guest, Charles Allen, AMP. Uh, Charles is the Director of Partnerships at the Institute for Economics and Peace. These partnerships include governments, non-government organisations, educational organisations, civil society groups, service groups and other institutes. Through partnerships, Charles is activating the Institute's positive peace framework globally. In his role with Victoria Police, Charles led strategic and operational change, shifting police to better adapt uh, and adopt community engagement. Charles's policing career includes many years of service in general duties, investigations, then senior management roles. He's also a director with various non-for-profit organisations and is experienced in hands-on peace building. He was deputy chair with Uniting Care Life Australia Assist uh, and is the vice president of the Rotary Club of Sydney. Charles is well respected amongst peace builders for his pioneering work in resilience and equally respected within policing for his community centred approach to police management. He was recently awarded the Australian Police Medal, a division of the Order of Australia, for his service in the community uh, of Victoria. It's going to be a great pleasure uh, to speak with Charles again tonight. Uh, and hopefully he'll be able to elucidate many of the new points uh, and new issues that are coming out of this first ecological threat report. Charles, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we're looking very much uh, to hearing you speak and to asking you our questions tonight. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also thank you to Professor Adard for, for the opening. 
Uh, I'm sitting here tonight in uh, Camaragal country of the Eora Nation and I have the, the good fortune not only to work in this, on this country but also live in this country. Uh, so uh, I, I pay my respects to the Camaragal people, uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, and uh, so also I'd like to thank uh, uh, Affinity. As I was mentioned, this is the, the, the third uh, edition of, of this series with, uh, with Affinity. Uh, so Affinity are, are becoming uh, certainly a dear partner of IEP and I, I certainly thank uh, Ackman for, uh, for his uh, determin determination in making this a really powerful uh, partnership. So uh, we have, have a slide deck which I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, to, to, to uh, be put up if I could, thank you. Logical. Uh, threat register. Uh, some of you may have uh, have, have joined our, our previous uh, events, uh, IEP Affinity uh, events, and may have some knowledge of, of uh, the Institute for Economics and Peace. Some may not. If you could have the next slide, uh, the Institute for Economics and Peace is an independent, not-for-profit uh, think tank. Uh, we're a global organisation, but headquartered uh, here in, in Sydney. And really, to, to summarise what we do, we're, we're in the business of, of measuring peace. Uh, not only measuring peace, but uh, also looking at uh, the economic benefits of peace and the economic impact of, of, of violence. Uh, why do we do this work? Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, prior to us doing this work, uh, it certainly wasn't uh, peace and its economic benefits weren't measured in this way. Uh, so IEP has been filling that gap for the last uh, uh, 14 years. Uh, you can see here uh, the suite of our, our most known uh, products, uh, the Global Peace Index and the, the Global Terrorism Index, probably the most known and notably the Positive Peace Report, which I'll actually be referring to tonight. Uh, next slide. Um, so the, the Global Peace Index is, is currently up to its, uh, uh, the 2020 edition was, was released in June of this year, I really encourage you to have a look at the Global Peace Index. It's uh, freely available, as are all our reports on, on our website, uh, Vision of Humanity. Also, with the release of the, the Global Peace Index, we uh, released a paper, a briefing looking at uh, COVID-19 and, and peace. So this is sort of to give uh, early insight into what was the impact of COVID-19 on peace. Uh, next slide. I mentioned that uh, uh, I'm, we're headquartered here in Sydney, but we are a, a global organisation with offices in New York, Brussels, The Hague, Mexico City and Harare. And this is really about uh, getting our research out there. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so the Institute for Economics and Peace, uh, uh, we uh, do our best to, to make our research uh, uh, attainable, uh, accessible, readable, practical. It's really practitioner focused uh, re research. So we certainly see uh, producing uh, reports and having them gathering dust on a, on a, on a, on a shelf is not going to be a game changer. So working hard to get our work out there is important for us. You can see that we have uh, significant reach through uh, our, our, our outreach and our, our communications. Uh, our research is picked up by a, a wide range of, of actors from multi multilateral organisations through to uh, grassroots uh, peace builders and development workers. And you can see some of the organisations there, some of the, the multi-latch OECD, Commonwealth Secretariat, World Bank, uh, uh, United Nations. Uh, our work's included in thousands of uh, university courses. And last year we had uh, over half a million uh, downloads of our report. reports. Sorry. Uh, so next slide. But uh, tonight we're here to talk about uh, the, the ecological threat register. Once again, uh, this was work released some 10 days ago. Uh, we had a, uh, our first uh, launch event uh, was uh, into the UK, second into the, the US, and this is uh, our Australia release. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to uh, present the report uh, to you this evening, if I could have the next slide. Uh, the Ecological Threat Register is, is uh, uh, like our other reports, available on our website, Vision of, of Humanity, and I encourage you to, if I spike your interest tonight, I certainly encourage you to, to have a look at the report, uh, download it, and uh, dive deeper into to the bits that uh, uh, pique your interest. As I mentioned, this is uh, the inaugural uh, ecological threat register. 
the register covers off on 157 countries, uh, which picks up 97% of the world's population. Clearly, 157 countries is in all the globe, all of the countries in the globe, but picks up a, a very large percentage of, of the population. Uh, the report covers off on eight areas of, of ecological uh, risk, and they're, they're bucketed in, into two areas. Uh, the first being resource scarcity, so that picks up uh, food security, water stress, uh, and population growth. Uh, and then the second bucket, if you like, being natural disasters, so floods, droughts, cyclones, rising temperatures and uh, sea levels. The, the ETR, or Ecological Threat Register, uh, looks at the data now, but also then extrapolates that data out to, to 2050 uh, to get a sense of uh, the potential threats over, over the coming decades. It's developed by the Institute of Economics and Peace, and certainly one of the, the points of differences of, with this report is not just uh, aggregating that threat data, but also bringing in our positive peace framework. Uh, which is a measure of a country's uh, resilience. Uh, so looking at uh, the threats for a country and identifying uh, well, what is a country's uh, ability to absorb that threat uh, and then thinking through uh, and uh, the, the impact of the threats and, and the country's resilience. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, the next slide after that. Uh, so the key, key findings for the report uh, and what we see that uh, 141 countries are exposed to at least one ecological threat between now uh, and 2050. Remembering that uh, we, uh, this report picks up 157 countries. Uh, 19 of the countries with the, the most threats are home to 2.1 billion people. And 10 of these countries, 10 of that 19, are uh, in the 40 least peace fund, uh, peaceful countries on the globe uh, as uh, ranked by the Global Peace Index. 6.4 billion people live in countries which are exposed to medium or high ecological threat. And what we see are three, three clusters, three ecological hotspots, if you like, uh, that are susceptible to collapse. Uh, and those three hotspots are the uh, Sahil Horn uh, Belt uh, in Africa from uh, um, Mauritania through to Somalia, uh, the Southern African Belt, uh, Syria through to Pakistan. Next slide. We had a look at, uh, of the countries most at threat, these are recipients for uh, climate-related uh, aid, and what we identified that only two of the countries most at threat uh, amongst the 10 largest recipients of uh, climate aid. Uh, we also identified that there uh, are three major immigration routes uh, due to ecological threat, uh, being movement from uh, Latin America to, or Central America through to US and Canada, uh, from Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, through to Europe, uh, South Asia and Middle East uh, through to, to Europe. Uh, we see that uh, 1.2 billion people in high risk, low resilient countries are at, uh, at risk of displacement uh, between now and 2050. Uh, so even without climate change, uh, ecological threats uh, uh, could lead to failed states. Go to the next slide, please. So here's a table of the countries that uh, feature highest in uh, ecological uh, threats. So this is uh, countries that uh, face uh, more than four uh, ecological threats. You can see that uh, uh, within these countries, uh, the three uh, least peaceful countries on the globe uh, being uh, Afghanistan, Iraq and uh, uh, Syria feature uh, in, this, uh, in this top 19 countries. Uh, also, so also when you start to look at the, the threat and uh, the peacefulness in, in, uh, of those particular countries and the population, uh, it, it paints, doesn't paint a particularly rosy picture. Uh, you know, Afghanistan with uh, six threats, the least peaceful country on the uh, globe and home to, to 40 million people. Syria, uh, four threats, second least peaceful country on the globe uh, with a population of 7.5 million. Uh, Iraq, four threats, third least peaceful country on the globe with a population of 40 million. Uh, Pakistan and India also worth mentions uh, 
Uh, Pakistan with four threats, it sits 130, 152nd on the Global Peace Index and a population of 220. Uh, and India with four threats, sitting at 139 out of 163 countries in, in, on the Global Peace Index with a population of 1.3 billion. Okay, next slide, please. So to bring this, this data into to a map, where we love our, our heat maps at uh, IEP, uh, and this heat map is, is colouring off the globe uh, with those aggregated uh, uh, threats and demonstrating those belts that I mentioned before uh, where uh, the, the most danger of uh, 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 these th uh, threats exist. So that, uh, that Sahil horn belt from, uh, in Africa from uh, Mauritania through to S Somalia, the Southern African belt from Angola to Madagascar, and that Middle Eastern belt from Central Asia to, to Syria. Pakistan. Next slide. I also mentioned when you look at uh, uh, these threats, uh, those, uh, those belts and then the potential movement uh, of people out of uh, those uh, high threat, low resilience areas. You can see the potential movement out of uh, uh, Central America into United States and Canada. Uh, that uh, the movement out of Africa into Europe and the movement out of MENA and uh, South Asia region uh, into Europe. Uh, you don't have to think uh, too far back and think of uh, the global impact of far, far lower numbers of, of movement in, in the last five years and the impact that that's had on uh, politically and on attitudes uh, uh, globally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, slide after that, thank you. I'll just touch on, uh, dive a little bit deeper on on uh, some of the threats and then uh, take a break for some questions uh, before having a discussion around resilience and, and positive uh, peace. So remembering that we looked at, uh, we, we bucketed up uh, threats uh, into, first of all, uh, resource scarcity, grabbing uh, population growth, uh, water stress and food security, and secondly, natural disasters, looking at floods, droughts, cyclones, rising temperatures uh, and sea levels. Uh, when we look at uh, population growth, uh, we see that uh, the global population is projected to reach uh, uh, 10 billion by 2050. Uh, by 2050, uh, the 40 least peaceful countries will have an additional 1.3 billion people and will come home to more than half of the, uh, the world's population. Uh, 17 countries in sub-Saharan Africa are projected to, to double their population by 2050, making it the fastest growing region globally, obviously placing a, a lot more pressure on uh, not only uh, uh, water, but also food security. Uh, next slide. Here's uh, some of those uh, statements uh, produced in, in a graph, and you can see that uh, high population rise in the very low peace and low peace uh, countries that will experience that uh, 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 higher population rise in the, in the coming decades. Uh, next slide. Uh, just touching on water stress, uh, we see that uh, 2.6 billion people live in countries experienced high or extreme water stress. Uh, and by 2040, this will increase to 5.4 uh, billion. And I have to mention that this includes uh, uh, India and China, and certainly the rise of uh, middle class in, uh, in those countries uh, will have uh, uh, a significant impact on, on water stress. We know that uh, developing countries uh, use, sorry, developed countries have a uh, far greater water consumption than, than developing countries. Uh, and overall, the combined effects of, of rising temperature, uh, population growth, uh, and increased rainfall variability uh, will reduce uh, future, future water availability. Uh, next slide. So here's, uh, and this is a, a lineal projection on uh, uh, water use extrapolated out to 2050 based on, on past trends and past increases uh, uh, in, in water use. And you can see that there's uh, some 50% uh, uh, increase in, in, water use, in water use between uh, uh, now and, and 2050. Uh, next slide. Touching on food security uh, and uh, food uh, insecurity means not having enough food for a healthy life, uh, be it intermittent or, or uh, a regular food supply. 
Uh, it's uh, an estimated two point, uh, sorry, an estimated two billion people currently face uh, food insecurity. Uh, and by 2050, uh, this figure is expected to increase to uh, 3.5 billion people. 58% uh, of the people in sub-Saharan Africa face food insecurity, uh, the highest for, for any region. Uh, and 65% of the population each in each of the world's least peaceful uh, countries uh, and low-income countries uh, experience, uh, will experience food affordability problems. So if you have the next slide. And here's that data presented uh, a little differently. When you look at the increase in food insecurity uh, in uh, recent uh, the recent years, you can see that uh, percentage growth, three, point, uh, three, percentage, three points of percentage growth uh, in food insecurity amounting to some 300 million uh, people uh, facing increased food insecurity. And I might add that this is uh, not confined to developing countries. It's also a phenomenon in uh, uh, developed countries. The next slide. This next slide is, a, is another heat map and it's you know, aggregating that uh, undernourishment and water scarcity stress. Once again, you see those same bands uh, are glowing, that uh, uh, Sahil uh, sub-Saharan region, that Southern African region, and also the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, MENA region and Southern, Southern Asia region. Those, those same bands showing up and also the, that band showing up in Central America. Okay, uh, next slide. Actually, we might just stop there. I'm looking at the time. Uh, Julian, I wonder if it's, if it's a nice time to, to break it up if we stop and, and take a, a few questions before we, we move on. Uh, the next aspect we'll look at is uh, natural disasters and then move into to positive peace and resilience. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, Okay, I, I think uh, we, Julian may have uh, frozen. Uh, so uh, I, um, what what I'll do is, oh, got you back, Julian. Sorry about that, Charlie. I lost you for a second there, but thank you for stopping. It's a great time, I think, to stop and uh, and have a bit of a discussion about what you've mentioned already uh, before we move on to, as you say, natural disasters uh, and then some more positive uh, information about positive peace afterwards. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the report in general. Um, what was it that, that, that really decided the Institute for International uh, Economics and Peace uh, to produce this report um, this year? Uh, and, and do you think the threat register will continue uh, into future years as well? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, so why? We, we certainly have followed uh, the, so the nexus between climate and peace. Uh, for, for a period of time. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we reported on that nexus between quiet climate and peace uh, in our 2020 Global Peace Index. So this year's uh, Global Peace Index and also touched on it uh, in uh, our previous reports. Uh, also, we have reported on the um, uh, sustainable development goals and some people may be aware of our, our work and looking at uh, particularly SDG uh, 16 but also across other SDGs and also diving deeper on the sustainable development goals in, in the Pacific. So it's been a growing field uh, for the Institute for Economics and, and Peace for, for a period of, of time. Uh, you know, probably outside of our, our original wheelhouse but has, uh, you know, uh, uh, has continued to grow, particularly with that nexus between between climate and peace. Uh, so this year, the the institute took uh, the the decision to to dive in uh, in deeper. You know, what what we're good at is is aggregating a vast range of, of data sets and trying to to make sense of those data sets so they uh, uh, create uh, uh, usable uh, reports. So uh, the intent was to to bring that expertise uh, to to this, this particular uh, thing. Uh, I, I stress that this is an, our inaugural report, uh, so I suggest that it will be iterative and uh, you know, you, you'll be aware that our, our Global Peace Index is now in its 14th year, so nearly a decade and a half of data. 
Uh, we see this as an ongoing report that will continue to uh, refine uh, and continue to produce uh, year in, year out. Thank you for the question. Absolutely, and I think that already, um, you know, I'm hearing and, and seeing uh, people around the world uh, responding to this report. Uh, there's a lot of interest being generated in Australia, uh, in Europe, in North America about this report, and I'm sure there will be many more in the future. Um, but I'm just wondering if there's anything particular about these these responses to this report, um, as opposed to the other work you do in, in Positive Peace or the Terrorism Index. Um, are you collecting any any real policy outcomes here, or any community actions, or um, is there momentum behind uh, this report that people would actually make a change and to go out there and to uh, to lobby governments or to do something to um, help prevent these sorts of uh, ecological problems? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, and thanks for the question. And uh, certainly, uh, the you know, the institute uh, we don't position ourselves as, a, as an advocacy. We, we position ourselves as a, a, as a think tank. Uh, but you're right, there has been a, a lot of uh, interest in this particular report uh, and the intent is for uh, for us to present and to support uh, some uh, uh, some global seminars uh, to think about some policy implications or policy outcomes as a result of, of this report. Uh, so that, uh, that they've been putting together uh, as, as we speak Actually, not as we speak, because everyone's knocked off. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, uh, you know, partners in that uh, in that quest. Uh, so, from development, we have uh, uh, Mercy Corps uh, as as a partner. Uh, certainly, uh, the uh, UN Secretary General's Office through the UN Seventy Five Project is is a, is a partner. Uh, the Institute for Climate and Peace, uh, which has had been following this this report as. As, uh, as you would uh, expect, they're a Hawaii-based organisation uh, funded by, I think it's Obama Foundation. They're very interested in this uh, uh, report and looking to fly into those uh, policy seminars. And uh, the Stimson Centre uh, in the US is also another partner. There's a couple of European partners which has slipped my mind. My apologies to them if, uh, if they're listening in, in tonight. So it's really great to see that some, some momentum has built ar around this uh, this report. Uh, we look forward to participating in those those round tables uh, to support the policy outcomes. Uh, maybe not policy outcomes, but policy recommendations that flow from, from the discussions. Absolutely. I mean, I can see this report having an enormous amount of impact in, in how people do things uh, and sort of recommendations they give to government in various parts of the world. Um, and with any piece of research of this size, it must have taken quite some time to to pull together all the statistics to um, to produce this report. Um, of course, uh, in the in the meantime, we've had the global pandemic, uh, an issue that's not unrelated um, to global ecological yep. systems and, and potential ecological threats. Um, I'm just wondering whether whether that has affected the production of this report at all. Um, whether the report is still sound uh, when we consider the impact of COVID nineteen this year. Um, what's yep. been the effect of the pandemic on this report? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And thanks for the question. Uh, certainly, uh, if, uh, and I encourage people who are really interested in the methodology to, to dive into the report and uh, you know, have a look at the methodology, have a look at the uh, the uh, uh, the sources for for the data, and you'll see that often uh, the the data sources that the closure date is before really the onset of of COVID nineteen. So uh, I, I say that because certainly the impact of COVID-19 is not picked up uh, in this, this report. But you don't have to think about the issue uh, too hard to know that COVID-19 is going to have, not going to, is having a significant impact on food security uh, yeah. uh, globally. Uh, so uh, the, the report is still sound. Uh, I suggest the, out, uh, the, the potential threats are uh, accelerated as a result of uh, COVID-19. A, uh, food security is a, a, a critical issue. Uh, B, uh, countries' resilience is, is being uh, uh, ex exposed. Uh, so if there was any impact from COVID-19, and certainly we'll, that will be more evident when we recut the data for uh, in the 2021 uh, Ecological Threat Register, uh, but certainly uh, the, the report is still sound, uh, COVID will have an impact on, uh, on accelerating. Uh, the threat, some threats. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in from uh, from the audience uh, around the world. Uh, so please uh, do keep keep writing your questions uh, into the chat box. Keep submitting them 
uh, through to me. We'll go back to the presentation now for a little while, uh, and then we'll come back in about 10 minutes or so, and we'll start to answer some of those questions uh, from the audience. So thank you very much. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So uh, as mentioned, the other aspect that we, we bring in is uh, our natural disasters. Uh, certainly, this is a forward uh, uh, projecting uh, report. As I mentioned, we extrapolate uh, uh, the, the findings out to, to 2050, but I think it's worthy to look at uh, the steady climb in natural disasters over the, uh, the last four decades. And you can certainly see that the big climbers have been uh, meteorological events, which include cyclones, cyclone type of events, and hydrological events, which in includes floods. Certainly one that's of most interest, uh, of a lot of interest in this country, and when I say this country, Australia, where many of us are sitting in, is a, a climatological events, uh, which includes extreme temperature, uh, including forest fires. So that's the, the orange bit on the tip of these bar graphs, and you can see there has been a climb in those events, albeit not as significant as the meteorological uh, and the uh, hydrological events. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at uh, natural disasters, certainly uh, floods and storm account for 72% of uh, natural disasters between 2090, uh, sorry, 1990 and 2019. Uh, natural disasters have displaced uh, or displaced 25 million people uh, in 2019. Uh, and this is really significant uh, when you think that uh, that is three times higher uh, than the displacement, which was 8.6. Uh, million people uh, displacement from armed conflict. So that there's you know, that a multiplying factor of three there for uh, natural disasters compared to uh, uh, armed conflict, which is uh, uh, a somewhat alarming statistic. Uh, one, pe uh, one billion people live in areas uh, that uh, combine high frequency intensity with na uh, natural disasters uh, with low areas of positive peace. So just to, to make that clear, there's one billion people living in areas that are that are at threat of uh, natural disasters, uh, but have low positive peace, therefore low resilience to be able to, to respond. So uh, next slide, and it's good op, good op, uh, that's a good leg in to talk about uh, positive peace. Yeah, next slide, thank you. Uh, so the Institute for Economics and Peace, we, we produced the positive peace report. We use two definitions to, to define peace. Uh, the negative definition of peace being the absence of violence or the absence of fear of violence is probably uh, uh, a definition that people uh, more re uh, relate to, uh, but certainly the, the more powerful definition being that positive definition being the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. And really, if you like, uh, positive peace is a measure of a country or a community's capacity um, to, to be peaceful or be, to become uh, more peaceful. Uh, and what we know about positive peace is that uh, uh, positive peace is an effective measure of, of resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Just quickly, how we derived at uh, positive peace and the positive peace uh, report. Uh, certainly positive peace is not a, a phrase that was uh, coined by IEP. It uh, was certainly a phrase coined by Johan uh, Galtung, uh, a uh, peace uh, academic who, and certainly we, we have worked with uh, that uh, definition being the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. So to build the positive peace report, uh, we looked at the most uh, peaceful countries. Uh, and the, the thinking behind this was, well, if you want to understand peace, why would you look at conflict? Why would you look at the least peaceful countries? Let's study the most peaceful countries. Uh, we identified the most peaceful countries through our work with uh, the Global Peace Index, uh, then looked at some uh, 30,000 data sets to identify what is it that correlates most closely uh, in the most peaceful countries in the, on the globe. From that, we're able to produce the uh, Positive Peace Index and Positive Peace Report. Uh, next slide. We identified 24 four indicators which uh, we built into this taxonomy, this, this framework called the Positive Peace Framework, and I won't dive too deep in, into, into this, but what we know is uh, that uh, uh, these pillars work together as a system. You know, it's, it's a systems thinking, uh, and when these pillars are working together uh, as a system, uh, countries 
uh, are more peaceful, uh, communities are more peaceful and have a greater capacity uh, for peace. Next slide. What we know about uh, uh, positive peace is that it, uh, uh, it uh, higher positive peace countries fare much better on a range of indicators and the indicator that's uh, relevant to the ecologic threat register uh, is that higher positive peace countries are uh, more resilient. Uh, by more resilient, meaning that they're better able to absorb shocks uh, to, to, to their community systems or, or to their, their country systems. Uh, so by that, you know, they're better, they're better prepared, uh, they're better able to respond and be better able to recover uh, to shocks to the system. You know, and never has that been more relevant than, you know, here we are in the, uh, the COVID era and we're seeing that uh, played out uh, uh, in, in live time. Uh, so, you know, positive peace is an effective measure uh, for uh, not only resilience, uh, but uh, a country or community's uh, adaptability. Uh, next slide. So, as I mentioned, uh, positive peace is, is an effective measure of, of resilience, but positive peace is also associated with uh, another, uh, a number of other highly desirable qualities within communities and countries, being that uh, higher per capita in income, uh, higher positive peace countries have better ecological performance, uh, higher positive peace countries have uh, better measures of well-being across a range of uh, indicators, including better uh, inclusion. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, positive peace deficits, uh, so countries that have a, a, a low positive, lower positive, uh, low positive peace, are a good indicator for poor falls in in actual peace. And the reverse is true. Uh, countries with higher positive peace uh, have uh, a higher likelihood to have likelihood of in increases in peacefulness. So next slide. So really the ecological threat uh, register is, is, is drawing together those aspects of uh, resource scarcity, uh, natural disasters, uh, and bringing in that, uh, that measure of uh, resilience, you know, a country's uh, ability to, to uh, respond, recover, uh, and, or, uh, be prepared, respond, and recover to uh, to shocks, whether the shocks are exogenous or or endogenous. And you can see here, this is yeah, a table, if you like, of some of the heat maps I, I showed you before, which sort of lists those countries that, uh, in this particular table, it's countries that uh, have a high number of uh, resource scarcity uh, uh, threats, uh, and uh, also. Uh, have low resilience, so a low positive peace score. And uh, next slide. And similarly, uh, this, this table uh, brings together the, the countries that uh, are at threat for a number, a range of uh, natural disasters, once again bringing in that, uh, that uh, resilience score. Uh, and uh, you can, I, I won't go through the table. Uh, it uh, reflects what you saw in those, uh, those heat maps. Uh, you can also see the population down on, on the, the, the right side there. And I, I mentioned before, you know, the, the impact of uh, global uh, uh, migration as, as, as a result of uh, ecological threats. And uh, next slide. So this is the, the, the last, slide and uh, probably here I'll put in my call to action. As, as I mentioned, the Ecological Threat Register is uh, available, freely available on uh, our website, uh, Vision of, of Humanity. I encourage you to, to, to have a look at, at, at the report and dive deeper on the, on the report. Uh, also on the Vision of Humanity site is uh, uh, the heat maps that I mentioned and you can uh, see some of the data that's sitting behind. Uh, those 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 heat maps. <clears throat> I've also touched on you know, positive peace uh, and uh, the the global peace index. Some of the other research uh, products of the the Institute for Economics and, and Peace. Uh, if you're interested in getting a deeper understanding of of, of our work, uh, I certainly encourage you. First of all, if your interest is in uh, the uh, Positive Peace Academy, uh, we have an online Positive Peace Academy. Once again, it's it's a free resource that you can use or send out amongst your networks, encourage you to, to use the, the Positive Peace Academy. And also we uh, currently have opened our IEP Ambassador Program. 
uh, and the Institute for Economics and Peace has some 1,600 uh, ambassadors uh, across 106 countries. And it's usually people who have picked up uh, uh, our work and somehow bring it into uh, their their day jobs, if you like, whether they're educators or, or peace builders or, or working development uh, teachers. Uh, uh, but a you know, really wide range of people are IEP ambassadors. So the IEP ambassador program is, is currently open for, for ap applications. Uh, if, if that's something that interests you, I would encourage you to, to uh, apply. Um, so thank you for for uh, the opportunity to present uh, the Ecological Threat Register. Uh, I'll hand back to uh, to Julian, who no doubt has uh, some more questions for me. Well, thank you very much again, Charlie, for a fantastic run through of an extraordinarily important and also an extraordinarily complex uh, piece of research work. Um, and thank you very much for, for your institute for doing this uh, extraordinarily important work um, on the global stage. So we've got lots of questions coming in um, from the audience. We'll start with one related to Australia. So we live in Australia, uh, in a country that's sometimes called a continent. Uh, we uh, expand across many different ecological zones, um, but we also experience lots of natural disasters in Australia. And so from your reading of the report and working uh, you know, in this research area, what's Australia's current sitting uh, in terms of ecological risk and uh, what does the future look like? Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And, uh, so when uh, we refine out the, the risks for, for Australia, uh, certainly we identify three risks, uh, three threats that are, are very relevant uh, and real uh, in Australia. I probably don't have to mention these, I'm sure most of us are very aware of them, but uh, certainly uh, droughts, uh, water stress and, and temperature uh, uh, are real threats uh, for this country. Uh, so, you know, there's three threats are, are relevant to, to, to Australia. You'll remember from some of uh, uh, those charts that were put up uh, that there are other countries that uh, featured highly in the Ecological Threat Register and also were only showing three threats. But uh, the, the point of difference is Australia uh, is a high positive peace country. Now, we have uh, a high level of uh, resilience in this country, and, and this is this has been demonstrated in you know the, the current and, and uh, uh, you know the recent very recent past. You know we, we experienced one of our worst fire seasons uh, uh, last fire season. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, there it, uh, you know it, with in a lesser resilient community, lesser resilient country that could be uh, crippling and, and cause collapse. But you know well highly resilient country, we, we have been able to recover from that threat. And I'm very conscious that there are many, many people who are still feeling the impacts of, uh, of that threat. So uh, uh, I'm very conscious of that. <clears throat> but relatively, we uh, have been resilient to that threat in, in that uh, we are able to respond uh, and on the road to recovery to that threat. You know, look at Australia's performance against uh, uh, COVID-19 is, is a, another example. Uh, very conscious we're still in the midst of this this threat and going to feel it for quite some time. Uh, but you look at uh, our, a, uh, 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 our, our response and, and our ability to cover uh, recover is far greater uh, than countries that are, are less resilient and, and uh, performing uh, more poorly uh, in positive peace. Uh, so thank you for the question. You know, the threats are real for this country. Uh, we're, the fo we're fortunate that we live in a country that has a high resilience. Absolutely. Um, you know, a resilient society, a resilient country. However, uh, you do mention uh, our neighbourhood. No country exists in and of itself. We always ex inhabit a region. We have neighbours. Um, and people have been asking in the in the you know, what's our responsibility to our smaller neighbours? We've seen um, Timor-Leste in some of the lists that you, you just put up. Uh, we can think about many of our near neighbours uh, in the Pacific that might be only facing one or two threats, but if those threats put them underwater, uh, that's it for the countries, let alone uh, just being a failed state, being a non-existent state. So what can Australia do and what should Australia do to reach out uh, to our neighbours yeah. and to our neighbourhood? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think the question is bigger than that. <laughs> what does the globe need to do <laughs> about the uh, uh, the threats that uh, that we face in the coming coming millennia? Uh, I think that is uh, is 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 the the, the bigger question. Uh, and certainly, Australia can't duck and weave un, under that 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 question. We're we're always conscious of being very 
uh, independent uh, uh, IEP. But you know, uh, globally, uh, global community has to, has to come together to 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 work through uh, through uh, uh, these uh, uh, issues. You know, and I think you know, uh, never uh, before <laughs> has uh, multi uh, multilateralism been more more important. Uh, and Australia is a significant player in, in this part of uh, uh, in this region. So you know, we, we have a responsibility uh, to to our neighbours. And you know, I think globally, it, it, the issue is you know, uh, shifting away from uh, that sort of uh, within border thinking to you know what is the, how do we deal with this this global threat? And certainly, the only way that's going to achieve is is through uh, global regional cooperation and global cooperation. Mm -hmm. And do you think that your your uh, you know your register of ecological threats and you've been able to point out a lot of these uh, threats, but more importantly, I think give data to them and, and weighting behind the the relative levels of risk. Um, is that going to help governments around the world, including Australia, accept the concept of uh, ecological refugees uh, and the phenomenon of ecological refugees? I mean, this is an issue that's been very controversial um, internationally for some time. How do you see that panning out in the in the few years? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you, I just want to pick up on one aspect there. You, you mentioned the the weighting behind the the different threats, uh, and certainly in the uh, the build of this this report, uh, and it is specifically called a ecological threat register uh, uh, for, for a purpose because it's not an index. You know, we uh, with uh, the global peace index, the the global terrorism index. Uh, certainly, our international panel of experts go through a arduous process of putting weighting uh, on different indicators that are that are aggregated to to form those indices. Uh, but uh, uh, a similar approach was taken with the register, but it uh, it proved uh, certainly uh, very difficult to to put weighting on those those different threats. So the register is a physical count of of threats relevant to. Uh, the particular nation states, the 153, 100, 153, sorry, 157 uh, nation states that uh, uh, within the register. So I just wanted to pick up on that that uh, aspect of of weighting. Um, but you're right, and certainly part of the motivation for uh, the register was to to build a uh, some reliable data uh, around uh, that uh, international. Uh, uh, global movement as a as a result of uh, the the impact of ecological threats uh, for just the processes that uh, that uh, are unfolding after the after the uh, release of the report. So that's creating uh, some data for uh, policy seminars to to think through uh, this 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 global issue uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, I think you know, we mentioned it before. Certainly, thinking through you know, how, firstly, regionally, that sort of uh, multilateral cooperation, but uh, globally, uh, uh, cooperation to to deal with this threat, as opposed to thinking about uh, uh, within the borders of our own countries. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> And I think for, for people at home who are, who are listening to your presentation or perhaps they've downloaded your, your report and are leafing through it, um, some people are a bit confused. I've got a question here about the absence of some areas that they, they think should be in there. So uh, one in particular is issue around biodiversity. Um, yep. It's sometimes said that we are doing, you know, the sixth great extinction uh, of the planet uh, through its history yep. and this time it's our fault, not a meteor or, uh, or something like that. Um, People might notice that the biodiversity and threats to biodiversity are not there, uh, but surely they must also have a, an impact down the track on, on peace in, in various ways. Yep. I mean, how do you how do you incorporate that sort of uh, factor into into future reports? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, and you would uh, uh, get no no argument from me. I don't think you get any argument from uh, the Institute for Economics and Peace. Uh, but uh, you know, our, our researchers uh, there. Uh, 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 quantitative researchers, you know, they're in the business of, of aggregating uh, data data sets. Uh, a, the, the data sets have, have, have got to exist. You know, we're in the business of aggregating data sets at uh, country level, also at a, at a macro uh, level. Uh, so A, the data's got to exist, the data's got to be uh, reliable, hopefully the data's got to, got to be current. So we're somewhat restricted to, to what is available. 
uh, certainly biodiversity is uh, uh, it, it's not picked up in the, the register so uh, great for the, the the people who are having a read and, and picking that up uh, you know and I think it's you know it's a really significant uh, uh, discussion uh, particularly given current uh, current events uh, so uh, 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 I mentioned that this is our, our inaugural ecological threat register uh, as as other data sets become uh, available or, or strengthen can we build on this work absolutely we can is it a gap uh, yes it is mm, yeah I have a question about how countries can take on board uh, the sorts of information that your organization puts out uh, yearly in its reports um, maybe not maybe not this one since it's the inaugural report however when we think about the terrorism index or the uh, the global peace index do you have any examples of, of how countries use the data that comes out of the Institute of Economics and Peace and actually physically applied it to try and um, try and improve their rankings? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, there's, there's many examples. Uh, so uh, my work, I'm not a researcher, my work is, is just that, is about working with partners to activate on, on our, our research and most of that is, a, is, a, is around positive uh, piece and you know we would take the same approach with the ecological threat register if we were looking for people to engage with that we'd be encouraging countries to to, to build uh, their resilience so, so to answer your question uh, a, a, I think a good example is uh, uh, Mexico um, so you know, Mexico isn't faring particularly well uh, but however uh, Mexico have uh, adopted the, this this uh, approach with with some vigor when I say this approach, uh, they have we develop annually. We produce a subnational indice for for Mexico, uh, so it's the Mexico Peace Index. It brings it down to uh, province or, or state level, uh, so that uh, uh, provides data that's that's more uh, more useful in uh, informing in country policy and in in country uh, resourcing. Now it's really interesting. Uh, you know, uh, and we're avid uh, Mexico. The watches we have an office in, in Mexico because of its large uptake of, of uh, uh, positive peace. Uh, states' performance against the positive peace report has become quite competitive, <laughs> uh, uh, encouragingly competitive uh, uh, within uh, within Mexico, uh, and we're certainly seeing sh signs of, of, of shifts uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, a, a big inhibitor in Mexico re re remains uh, corruption. We have some, some real encouraging encouraging trends starting to happen there. I'd like to come to another example, which is sort of uh, more uh, granular uh, and community-based. And uh, it's my current favourite favorite example, and uh, it's a piece of work that happened in, in the Philippines. So a small grassroots organisation uh, in the Philippines led by one peace builder uh, looked to, to work with the community of Pacuabato in uh, Mindanao uh, in, in the Philippines. Uh, and that uh, is an area that has been uh, in the grips of uh, conflict for, for over, over three decades. Uh, so this peace builder convinced the mayor of uh, the city of Dabao to, to take a different approach, to shift away from a counter-insurgency approach to a, a positive peace building approach in, in that uh, Pacuabato district, which consisted of uh, some 16, 17 barangay or, or villages, if you like. Uh, so they did, and uh, you know, uh, they, they worked through a process of first getting a local community on, on board, local barangay uh, uh, leaders, uh, the, 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 the uh, heads of the women's organisations, who were heads of the indigenous organisations, uh, getting local buy-in and thinking through what it is, what they could do to build on strengths within their, in their community. Uh, the, the turnaround was remarkably fast. In, in the space of, of 18 months, uh, the insurgents in um, the Pacuabato district uh, uh, surrendered and laid down their arms. It was never an intended outcome of the project. The project was always around community strength building, uh, but what happened uh, with that shift in uh, towards a more positively peaceful community is, is actual peace uh, uh, also, uh, uh, also improved. Uh, so, and uh, there, there's examples of this, this case study is on our website, Vision of Humanity, you can go down and look at what happened against those, those pillars and what the community did to shift uh, their, their social system to, to be more peaceful. What is really interesting, and this has only, only happened at the start of this year, uh, and uh, what happened is uh, the uh, Philippines uh, government uh, certainly 
uh, took a whole lot of interest in, in what happened in, in Papua Butter and thought, you know, we've really got to shift our thinking away from counterinsurgency to uh, a peace building approach. And they adopted that positive peace framework uh, as uh, their new policy platform for their community uh, community re renewal policy. I'm not sure that's the exact name of the policy. So it was a, a, a great uh, a great outcome for the community of Papua Butto. Uh, it's somewhat stalled at the moment because uh, communities have become more focused on survival through through COVID-19. But uh, we're hoping to increase uh, that uptake of positive peace uh, uh, in the Philippines. And, and thank you very much for the question. Absolutely, and thank you very much for responding. Uh, I think that's a really fascinating and really important example of how positive peace building can be a lot more effective than just focusing on the negatives and, and papering over the issues, so to speak. And I've got one final question uh, in from the audience. Uh, it's one personally to you. Um, it's a tricky one to end on here, but um, what do you think will happen to the Global Peace Index, but also to the Ecological Threat uh, Register uh, if a new US government is elected in November? So over to you, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a tricky one because uh, we, uh, we're very careful about uh, making, making any uh, uh, political comment. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, if we're, uh, I'm going to duck this by so, you know, looking at uh, global trends uh, and we, we picked up uh, and uh, this answer will go some way to address, uh, address the, 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 the question. When we look at uh, global trends, uh, particularly when we look at the positive peace report, uh, what is impacting on decreasing uh, uh, peacefulness uh, uh, globally uh, is, is attitudes. So when you dissect the positive peace report, bring it down to uh, domains, uh, it is uh, global attitudes that have trended in the negative uh, over the, the past decade. While institutions and structures have improved, attitudes are what's holding us back. Uh, so, uh, and I, I, what has impacted on, on those, uh, and certainly an outcome of those attitudes globally has been you know, adoption of uh, uh, ultra-nationalist uh, viewpoints and uh, you know, a shift in uh, the, the political landscape. Uh, so uh, we uh, certainly, uh, personally, I, I hope for uh, an outcome that uh, 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 provides opportunity for, for attitudes to, to shift in a, a more positive direction. Well, thank you very much for that, that masterful answer of a, a very important, very difficult question, Charlie. And thank you again so much for a fantastic uh, presentation this evening, a fantastic um, introduction to the important work um, that you do. And if anything can inform global attitudes and hopefully change them for the better, um, work like the ecological threat. Uh, report, I think, will go a long way to doing that. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Charlie. And to end the night, I'd like to call upon Affinity's Executive Director, Ahmed Pollitt, to present the concluding remarks of the program. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Julian. Good evening, every, everyone, and my newly extended families, uncles, cousins, aunties. Thank you for virtually joining tonight uh, to Affinity's third webinar episode, partnering with the Institute for Economics and Peace, IEP. I am delighted to co-host this event tonight with peace-loving and peace-oriented people. First and foremost, I would, I would, uh, I would like to sincerely thank our co-host, my esteemed friend, I call him cousin Charles Allen, APM, Director of Partnerships at IEP, for once again enlightening us with an insightful and significant presentation. It is truly an honor to be in partnership with IEP to help contribute to world peace. I would also like to sincerely thank my esteemed cousin, Dr. Julian Drogon, senior lecturer at Macquarie University for fantastically facilitating another Affinity webinar episode. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank our esteemed board member, Professor Monica Attert, for the warm welcoming of the program. I strongly believe as inhabitants of this world, it is our ethical and human duty to protect nature. The establishment of a green and balanced world can only be achieved by awakening to the facts we have heard tonight and by making a change. The metro protecting of 
protecting the ecological balance falls in the hands of humanity. Tonight, I'm truly delighted to say that we have had a great opportunity to launch and learn more about the 2020 Ecological Threat Register. The latest research product from the Institute for Economics and Peace. I believe Charlie's and Julian's conversation has allowed us to have a better understanding of the relationship between environmental factors and the kinds of dynamics that have led to violent conflicts. What we have learned over the years is that the relationship between humanity and our environment isn't that straightforward. It is conditioned by other factors in this context, particularly the quality of governance, economic growth, which disregards humans and environment, but is only based on getting wealthy is unacceptable. The strengthening of democracy and the maintenance of a state of law are important opportunities for the improvement of the country's economic wealth as well. All these characteristics condition the relationship between the environment and conflict. Justice in the world must go hand in hand with ecological justice if peace is to be made. We are incredibly delighted to be partnering with IEP tonight. The Ecological Threat Register recognizes that it is the interaction between ecological threats and resilience that matters. The essence of the three IEP episodes we have had the honor of streaming is the definition of peace. Although peace may be one word, its impact and dimensions are unmeasurable. Distinguished viewers, finally, I would like to share with you Affinity's upcoming events. The last five months, Affinity has extended its partnership with many other highly distinguished institutions, and we continue to build new partnership projects through the journey of education. On October 3rd, Affinity Youth, along with UN Youth New South Wales, Multicultural New South Wales, and Lawyers Weekly, will discuss COVID-19 and its impact on multicultural youth. The youth of the night are Mr. Sanjay, Ms. Pauli and Ms. Esta with, uh, with facilitator ABC reporter, Ms. Lydia Fang. On October 7th, Affinity and the Law Council of Australia will be presenting the first episode of the Domestic Violence Webinar Series. This episode will be in recognition of Mental Health Month and will host the Honorable Attorney General Mark Speakman and the President of Law Council of Australia, Paul and Wright. Facilitating this event is ABC TV radio presenter and the senior court reporter for New South Wales, Ms. Jamal Wells. For further information, please have a look at Affinity's website or Facebook page. Thank you to our listeners from home and our distinguished speakers, Julian and Charlie, and supporters. I look forward to seeing you at another Affinity program. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.